Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you all today to the second uh, webinar uh, sponsored by Bridge to Life for the ILTS, uh, Liver Machine Perfusion. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, the, delve into the aspects regarding uh, liver, liver machine perfusion at the frontier, uh, the use of uh, liver machine perfusion around the world. Um, and we have three experts today, uh, Dr. Christian Quintini from Cleveland Clinic, Paolo Muyasan from Birmingham in the UK, and Paolo Martins from the University of Massachusetts. Um, so uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Christiana Quintini. He's the Director of Liver Transplantation at the Cleveland Clinic. He's also a staff physician in liver transplant and HPV surgery there. Uh, he has expertise that ranges from complex liver surgery to uh, advanced liver forms of liver transplantation, living donor, and also machine perfusion. So with that, I would like to uh, give the mic over to Dr. Quintini so he can give his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amelia. Good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. good afternoon. Depending good on where you're connecting. Where you're connecting my name from. is Cristiano Quintini, and uh, my task uh, today is to give you an update on liver machine perfusion uh, uh, clinical trial updates. I would like to thank the organizer for the kind invitation, as well as uh, Dr. Chang Liu, my research associate, and Luca Del Prete, who is a research fellow in our uh, department, who helped uh, uh, putting together this uh, presentation. Um, XVivo is funding some of our uh, research uh, uh, projects, and this is my only disclosure. A common denominator of all perfusion technology is that uh, they utilize uh, a pump, uh, some form of oxygenation, and a perfusion fluid. Machine perfusion can be performed at different uh, temperatures, although normothermia and hypothermia are the most commonly used uh, um, technologies in the clinical uh, practice. Uh, the uh, different perfusion protocols can be applied, such as slow perfusion uh, rewarming, dual or single uh, vessel perfusion, and most importantly, different technologies can be combined together. Two special aspects of machine perfusions are represented by ischemia-free liver transplantation and normothermic uh, regional uh, perfusion. Trials have been designed to test different properties of the existing technologies. For instance, machine perfusion may be used to extend preservation time, decrease the post reperfusion injury in marginal organs, assess organ variability, and even intervene uh, in the graft. So we're currently uh, seeing an exponential proliferation of machine perfusion trials all around the world. Therefore, we performed a search in the trial registries in Europe, North America, and China. Uh, numerous keywords pertinent to the liver perfusion field were uh, searched. Interestingly, approximately uh, 97 trials were identified with only 31 uh, that were pertinent to the search after uh, proper screening. And uh, interestingly, about uh, half of the studies involved the equally normothermic and uh, hypothermic ex situ machine preservation with a uh, uh, few uh, trials registered uh, about sequential uh, hypothermic and normothermic machine preservation and uh, ischemia-free uh, liver transplantation. Uh, the, uh, this is the, uh, so therefore I will try to give an update on all uh, the different uh, technologies. Uh, this is the uh, only completed and published randomized controlled trial in liver machine uh, preservation. Uh, in, this, in this study on 220 patients aimed to assess the safety and feasibility of the organ of the metro device, the authors found a lower peak AST, a 50% lower organ discard rate, and a significantly uh, uh, longer mean preservation time. Uh, this, this trial is very important uh, because it uh, uh, lays the foundation for many of the studies that I will describe in the next uh, uh, few slides. For instance, this is a uh, slide summarizing some of the single centers, uh, center trials in uh, North America, looking at different uh, uh, preservation solution during normal thermic machine preservation, and also uh, laying some uh, preliminary work about the back-to-base uh, approach, which I will describe in the next few slides. Uh, in this, uh, in this uh, um, trial, uh, the authors looked at a very important aspect of normothermic machine, machine preservation, which is 
its ability uh, to uh, mitigate and in many instances prevent the post reperfusion syndrome, particularly for those very uh, marginal uh, graphs. The authors, uh, the authors uh, found in this uh, paper that when machine perfusion was applied, the uh, post reperfusion syndrome was basically uh, inexistent with uh, um, a uh, coagulopathy that was not uh, uh, really uh, an issue after reperfusion. In this uh, uh, study, uh, authors looked at the impact of a normothermic uh, uh, machine preservation on uh, uh, all the donors, and the authors found that uh, uh, with the uh, proper uh, technique and selected uh, uh, graft, uh, this uh, um, technology can be safely applied for uh, older, older donor as well. In this uh, study, the author looked at the impact of uh, NMP initiation on uh, graft outcomes, the so-called back-to-base approach. And this is an important study given the uh, logistical challenges of uh, transporting uh, these large uh, and heavy devices. At the present time, uh, a larger, uh, I believe, a larger multi center study is uh, recruiting in Europe to shed light on this uh, aspect of uh, normothermic uh, machine uh, preservation. Uh, given uh, the preliminary uh, reports uh, of excellent outcomes with a much longer total preservation time, centers have also uh, started to explore the ability of excite normothermic machine preservation to avoid the nighttime transplant and even improve the logistics of. Uh, simultaneous uh, liver transplantation. This is a paper from the group in uh, Innsbruck. And uh, the United States uh, uh, has been uh, lagging behind uh, in the field of organ preservation. This is because of the cost associated with uh, many of the trials that needed to approve uh, uh, devices uh, through the FDA. Uh, however, as, as you can see from this uh, uh, paper, there is a exponentially uh, growing uh, use of uh, machine preservation in the United States. Just in the last uh, year, um, more, nearly 100 uh, plus uh, transfer have been performed using this uh, technology. So we'd like to spend a few uh, slides uh, about the issue or the topic, I should say, of orphan levers. These are uh, levers that have been uh, declined for transplantation and uh, uh, and, uh, and researchers are, are trying to figure out ways of uh, predicting uh, viability of uh, many of these uh, discarded uh, organ. Uh, and uh, uh, the group in uh, England have uh, uh, paved the way for many of these uh, studies. Um, these are slides are summarizing some of the most uh, uh, important studies in the field of organ uh, of orphan liver transplantation. Uh, this is a, a work from uh, Chris Watson, who identified in uh, uh, bile, uh, bile quality, particularly pH, the um, importance uh, as, a, as a predictor factor in the development of uh, ischemic type biliary stricture and uh, even primary graft uh, non-function. Of the 47 levers that were declined, he was able to use uh, 22 levers uh, as they were judged uh, uh, viable. In uh, other work from, uh, from uh, the Birmingham group, particularly from uh, Heineck Margental, um, was uh, to basically define a very uh, clearly identifiable criteria for, uh, for uh, viability. In his work, he was able to uh, transplant organs uh, that had been uh, uh, discarded, about 70% of them, using some viability criteria that uh, are uh, uh, under the uh, definition of vital criteria. These are based on lactate clearance to level of uh, uh, less than 2.5 millimole per liter within the first uh, four uh, hours, and uh, plus uh, at least uh, two of the following criteria, uh, consistent uh, uh, by production, pH uh, um, less than, uh, more than 7.3, and, um, excuse me, and uh, um, glucose metabolism and uh, hepatic artery uh, and portal vein hemodynamics that are appropriate, as well as uh, homogeneous uh, uh, graft uh, perfusion. In um, the field of hypothermic uh, uh, machine preservation, uh, there are several, uh, several ways of defining uh, the uh, protocol used uh, during hypothermic uh, organ preservation. Uh, oxygen can be uh, given uh, passively or it can be given actively. And uh, the, there can be a single uh, vessel versus dual vessel 
uh, infusion. And um, from, from this, the name of uh, hypothermic machine preservation, if there is passive, um, passive use of oxygen through the atmosphere, whereas if there is active oxygenation through the, through the portal vein, uh, this uh, is uh, named as a hope uh, and a dual hope is when the hepatic artery is also used for uh, oxygenated infusion. The, uh, this is a landmark study by uh, Guerrera, who introduced the concept of uh, orphan levers and looking at uh, the ability of a hypothermic machine uh, preservation as a tool to rescue untransplantable levers. He was able to show uh, results are very um, uh, comparable to the standard uh, criteria donors that have been uh, preserved with uh, static uh, cold uh, storage. This was an important uh, proof of concept study. Uh, the University of Zurich uh, um, group has also been leading the way with the HOPE, the hypothermic oxygenated uh, perfusion, and uh, they uh, proved that, that this is an extremely uh, effective uh, uh, technology in uh, uh, preserving and reoxygenating and, 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 and re establishing ATP uh, charge in uh, uh, ischemic uh, organs. And most importantly, they were able to uh, establish a uh, viability marker criteria, uh, which uh, traditionally have been uh, uh, challenging for, the, uh, for, for when the liver is uh, in a hypothermic condition, and therefore, is not metabolically uh, active. Um, the group from Bro uh, Groning Groningen has uh, done uh, tremendous work in the in dual hypothermic oxygenated perfusion uh, field, the D-HOPE, and um, uh, they have demonstrated over and over the ability of uh, uh, this uh, technology again to restore uh, ATP level in uh, and ischemic uh, organs. And uh, this uh, work has uh, laid the foundation uh, for um, the previous works uh, have laid the foundation for a, a pilot randomized uh, control uh, hypothermic machine preservation uh, study uh, in the United States. Uh, this uh, is a randomized control trial on 140 uh, participants and is uh, um, well underway and estimated to be uh, completed by 2021. The uh, Matteo Ravioli and his uh, group in Italy have tested another new device that, that is uh, um, coming to uh, market uh, for the perfusion of not just liver but also kidneys. It's a simple uh, device and very easy to use. And uh, they use uh, uh, oxygenated uh, uh, perfusion. Uh, so it's a HOPE uh, system. And um, there, there will be soon uh, studies also to seek uh, regulatory approval uh, in the US. But what's interesting about uh, all these technologies that have been uh, used uh, not just for uh, preservation, but also uh, for uh, other uh, organ intervention. In this case, this is a, a manuscript, this is a, a manuscript a study from uh, Italy again, where uh, HOPE was uh, used to uh, preserve and uh, split uh, a graft that was uh, transplanted into uh, different uh, recipients. A few words uh, about control oxygenator rewarming. This is a protocol that has been uh, uh, studied extensively by Thomas Minor in the University of Berlin. And uh, it's based on the rationale that a slow, gradual rewarming uh, is uh, in fact a protective uh, for ischemic reperfusion injury, particularly for a marginal graft. He's also published a subsequent uh, paper showing the long-term uh, protective effects of this uh, uh, technology. Uh, now, normothermic regional perfusion is uh, extensively used in uh, uh, Europe, and, and this is a paper from one of the leaders in the field uh, from Barcelona, who um, basically, where basically this technology is the only technology that is allowed in uh, DCD. In uh, the United States, this technology has been moving very slowly for uh, uh, regulatory reasons, although I have to say that in the uh, past uh, a few weeks, uh, um, I've seen uh, uh, transplant uh, centers and, and organ procurement organization using this more as a, a standard of care for uh, certain uh, DCDs. Uh, regarding combined protocol, one of the most uh, uh, powerful, I think, uh, uh, concept of uh, uh, machine preservation is that uh, different uh, temperature and different protocols can, can be uh, combined. And um, this is a uh, uh, great uh, work uh, done by uh, Robert uh, Porter, Porter, who 
basically is um, combining uh, the best aspect of each technology all in one uh, study, uh, where basically uh, st um, study the effect of uh, uh, three different phases, a viability uh, assessment phase that was uh, preceded by one hour of uh, uh, DHOP, which function as a resuscitation phase and mitochondrial reconditioning, and uh, one hour of controlled oxygenated rewarming which is a transition phase uh, based on the work uh, by uh, Thomas uh, Mann. And uh, using this uh, protocol, it was able uh, to show that about 20% uh, uh, more organs could be uh, transplanted compared to um, uh, no protocol being used and with excellent uh, outcomes. These are other uh, studies from Italy where uh, sequential use of uh, normal thermic regional uh, perfusion uh, was uh, used in combination of uh, uh, hypothermic uh, machine uh, preservation. Um, and uh, in conclusion, uh, I also wanted to spend a few words about ischemia uh, free liver transplantation. This is a protocol that has been extensively uh, studied and implemented by a group in China. And um, in, in the first uh, paper, they uh, um, demonstrated as a proof of concept that this is feasible. And in fact, uh, um, a technology that can have a lot of potential, as demonstrated by a subsequent study on a very uh, fatty liver. Uh, basically, we were able to show that um, by transferring without ischemia, this is a very fatty liver, um, all the organs uh, function uh, very well. So, in uh, conclusion, I think we're, uh, uh, we all agree that we're witnessing an exponential proliferation of machine perfusion uh, trials. Uh, mostly HMP and NMP, but also a lot of combined uh, uh, protocols. Uh, randomized control trials are uh, designed to prove safety and feasibility for regulatory reasons. Uh, for the, for um, uh, as a consequence, single center studies are uh, most uh, the most valuable studies to to show how this uh, technology can, uh, in fact, uh, uh, push the boundaries of uh, uh, organ preservation. And ex situ liver uh, viability criteria continues to be a very challenging uh, field because we um, have witnessed very few uh, failures. And without uh, witnessing failure, we cannot understand what are the uh, viability markers able to predict uh, uh, outcomes. And I, I say, again, I believe the combining protocols or uh, tailoring them for different gra graphs uh, type will be uh, key in the future. And that continue work, uh, continue work to decrease cost, improve logistics, and ease of use of this uh, technology will be critical for the success of uh, machine preservation. Thank you very much for the attention. On the, on the website. Um, we already have a question from Dr. Uh, Jerwin De Jong from uh, the Netherlands. If you see any rationale for an NRP versus HOPE trial? Um, I, absolutely. I think uh, any trial is going to add uh, something to the field. Um, I, I, I think uh, traditionally we have looked at these technologies as uh, mutually exclusive, uh, warm versus cold. Uh, NRP versus HMP, and I think uh, perhaps retrospectively this is a slight mistake because I think uh, um, I, I think we're going to show that when these uh, technologies interact together, they're gonna they're gonna be uh, very very powerful. Also, I think every trial uh, from every trial we really learn learn something something different. So uh, absolutely, I would welcome a, a comparison of these two technologies. And perhaps a third group where the two technologies are, are even uh, combined. Thank you very much. We have another question. I don't know who it's coming from, but um, the question is, what are the most sensitive and early biomarkers for organ damage and survival? Sorry for the noise. I'm sorry, Mary, could you repeat the question? So the most sensitive uh, and early biomarkers for organ damage and organ survival during uh, perfusion, I believe. Yes, I don't think anybody knows. I think, uh, um, so if you look at the literature, uh, particularly for uh, normal thermic machine preservation, the most important uh, uh, sort of parameter is lactic acid clearance. 
Um, now, we in our group have, a, a, if you look at the literature, basically, virtually no liver, no liver has been transplanted that did not clear lactic acid. Uh, but in our group, we experienced after actually successful liver transplants, even with the uh, grafts that um, um, did not clear the lactic acid very effectively. So I think we just don't have enough information. I think. Uh, I think uh, we uh, are translating into machine perfusion what we think in the clinical practice are relevant uh, markers like by productions or again lactic acid clearance. But I don't think we really have an answer. I think more studies are needed. We need to push the limits. Uh, unfortunately, have failures, experience failures. And then from from this analysis, understand which criteria are are, are uh, most sensitive and specific for for uh, viability prediction. I know you have some limited time and you have to go. I have one more question from Ravish, Ravish Raju. Which situations would be the best for combination of machine perfusion techniques? I think, uh, I don't think there is a universal um, good combination. I would say different grafts have different needs. For instance, uh, I think there's pretty convincing uh, uh, evidence that uh, um, recharging the ATP uh, with oxygenation in cold temperature could be actually really uh, protective. Uh, also, there's a lot of good evidence uh, from Spain, and we, we've, we've just done our first graft here in the US a few days ago, that uh, normothermic machine uh, uh, perfusion can really uh, convert a, a DCD in a DBD organ uh, in a very powerful way. So uh, I think uh, uh, fatty livers may respond differently to cold, uh, to cold uh, uh, resuscitation, so maybe those graft uh, uh, are uh, um, better served with normothermic machine preservation. Those are all uh, open uh, questions. I don't think, uh, again, we have enough tools to, to make the, the, the call at this point. Thank you so much for your time. I know you have to go. We really appreciate uh, your talk today. I think it was excellent. So now we're going to move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Paolo Mui. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Paolo Muyasana is a professor of HPV surgery and transplantation at the University of Birmingham. He leads the living donor auxiliary domino and DC liver transplantation programs there. And he has other clinical and research interests which include normothermic regional perfusion and remeshing machine perfusion. So with that, I'm going to let, uh, give the mic over to Dr. Muyasan. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'd like to thank ILTS for the creation of this series of webinars, ILTS Insights and Amelia for organizing this session and for having me. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to start with this uh, preliminary results from uh, machine perfusion survey from uh, uh, Dr. Schlegel, uh, looking at the surgeons, physicians, nurses, and coordinators or transplant professionals and their expectations from machine perfusion. The great majority wants more quality function and less complications uh, from uh, 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 machine perfused grafts. And uh, looking at complications in particular, we, we know that control DCD donors have got their own uh, set of uh, complications, particularly ischemic cholangiopathy, which is quite uh, associated with uh, graft loss. And this is the reason why it's been 20 years that people started rethinking of uh, machine perfusion, a new way of uh, preservation technology to overcome the limitation of static cold storage particularly in DCD donors and in ECD donors. And uh, the machine perfusion comes with two main concepts. One is to reduce cold ischemia, and the, one, the other one is to prevent uh, reperfusion uh, damage. The IFOD concept, uh, ischemia-free organ transplantation, is a complete absence, uh, obliteration of uh, cold ischemia, and uh, is done in China in a single center and necessitates the, of uh, in-situ and ex-situ machine technology. The normothermic regional perfusion is a, a, a more popular concept, uh, uh, and, uh, and also the upfront normal and hypothermic uh, perfusion, which is done uh, at the donor side. Uh, uh, whereas the uh, prevention of reperfusion damage is done at back to base, is like an attempt of repairing uh, the graft at the transplant center is more convenient and uses end ischemic normal or hypothermic machine perfusion. Normal thermic regional perfusion, uh, it's uh, more popular in Europe. I started with uh, uh, Spain, uh, which who was using it in the uncontrolled donation and now is using, is using with category three donors. France has got a, 
national transplant program in the UK and Italy are slightly more limited by the uh, uh, law as in the UK you have to open up the donor and cannulate the femoral uh, the iliac vessels because you cannot uh, uh, put the cannulas or wires in the femoral veins and in Italy you're penalized by a standoff time of 20 minutes so that uh, uh, is not just NRP, but it's a combination of NRP and machine perfusion that is used to uh, make these livers viable for transplantation. And these are the two main experiences from the UK and uh, from Spain regarding normal thermic machine perfusion. And they have good numbers and they have uh, really uh, the same outcome, which is uh, in ischemic type biliary lesions, biliary complications in general, and graft loss are reduced in normal thermic regional perfusion as compared to static uh, cold storage. Now in Europe, uh, is, uh, you'll see, we already see in France, Italy, Spain, and the UK are the main uh, players, uh, and also there are cases in uh, Switzerland and in Rotterdam. But this is the revolution. This is uh, reperfusing uh, uh, retrieved uh, livers uh, with uh, blood and uh, oxygenated blood. And I'm not going to talk about this because uh, th this is not the remit of my talk really, but uh, I just want to show you that in this uh, uh, nice paper from Mergento and colleagues from Birmingham looking at uh, transplantation of discovered livers with NMP using the Organox device uh, and uh, developing also viability criteria. But uh, the biliary complications have not changed and uh, the ITBL rate in this paper was still 18%. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, non-normothermic -no machine perfusion is particularly um, developed in uh, uh, Europe and uh, in the States as practice with Indian Australian having a, a small number of uh, perfusions. We called uh, preservation techniques, uh, including uh, HOPE from Zurich, uh, dual HOPE from Herningen, and uh, uh, hypothermic machine perfusion with oxygen from Guerrera. Uh, Guerrera, by the way, did the first uh, uh, machine perfusion uh, uh, liver transplant uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, hypothermic machine perfusion and HOPE is more prevalent in Europe than in the States and there is uh, uh, one case in South America and a uh, couple in India. Now, reviewing the retrospective uh, uh, data uh, in a meta-analysis uh, uh, from hypothermic machine perfusion and biliary complications, we can see that uh, compared to cold storage, uh, uh, hypothermic machine perfusion has uh, favorable results in terms of the set of biliary complications and one graft uh, year survival. Uh, and um, uh, but the, the non-retrospective uh, prospective clinical trials data are about to come. And these are the trials that are active in Europe right now. As you can see, most of them are randomized. Most of them involve hypothermic machine perfusion. This is a normal thermic uh, machine perfusion from Valencia looking at steatotic grafts. Uh, but uh, these two uh, down here that have been completed, the dual hope uh, uh, looking at DCT liver grafts and biliary complications, and the hope uh, from Zurich, uh, uh, as I said, they've been completed in terms of recruiting, and we're just waiting for follow up and publication of, of data. Uh, in the US there is, uh, and Canada, there is a difficult, different uh, situation as most of these are normal thermic machine perfusion trials. Most of these are non randomized. The only randomized one are the LifePort called perfusion system trial and the WP01, which uh, is uh, more or less the counterpart of uh, uh, the COPE trial in Europe in the US. Then there are two Canadian trials that are single arm using the Organox device. And uh, there is also, there are three trials from Cleveland Clinic. They use their own uh, uh, machine and uh, these are all uh, single arm uh, uh, trials. And looking at the endpoints for machine perfusion trials, the transaminases uh, uh, levels uh, have been used uh, quite a lot, but they, they don't give us uh, really uh, much information on the graph function. And a similar uh, endpoint is EAD. It's mainly based on transaminases 
and uh, the most of the DCDs, up to 70% of DCDs, meet the criteria of EAD, even though they have a perfect uh, liver function. Uh, so EAD has got some arbitrary cutoffs uh, issues uh, and maybe for DCDs needs to be re-looked at. In terms of uh, uh, post-transplant complications, we need to capture uh, in the full the complications and the CCI is a good uh, tool for that. And in terms of graft survival, we need an adequate follow-up and from the benchmark study uh, in liver transplantation, it looks like uh, it becomes adequate uh, at 12 months in terms of biliary complications, CCI uh, points and graft loss. In Southeast Asia, there is no machine perfusion, but Singapore is ten, intend to start uh, with the Organox device uh, at 6,100 approximately euros uh, per disposable. And uh, this is gonna be a service development uh, and being a hub for Malaysia, Thailand and the Philippines. Japan also does not have a machine perfusion, but uh, uh, Naoto Matsuno has been studying the uh, issue for more than 20 years and has done research on porcine livers. And on the clinical front, uh, they do kidney transplants on machine perfusion. And uh, Kyoto has got approval for four lung transplants. Korea, they have no center doing machine perfusion, despite that there is, compared to Japan, they have a little bit more cadaveric donors that are increasing, but still there is uh, interest from the surgeons in machine perfusion. Latin America produce a good number of transplants, particularly Brazil. Uh, the only center doing machine perfusion, it's uh, Rio de Janeiro is doing HOPE with a liver assist device. They've done seven cases and the consumables are 6,600 euros uh, uh, per case. In Australia, only two centers uh, are doing it. We've done about 20 cases between the two using the Organox machine at 12,300 12, approximately uh, euros uh, per uh, perfusion. Uh, Sydney does some uh, research on HMP, and in New Zealand, they have no plans to start, but they say it's too expensive for 50 liver transplants a year. So we have, may have a, a, a relationship here between uh, the cost of uh, machine perfusion and the volume of uh, liver transplant centers. In India, the first case had been done in Bangalore, but also about up to 20 cases were done uh, between Delhi, Hyderabad, Chennai, and uh, then uh, nomothermic machine perfusion was withdrawn from the country and there's been an initial approach with uh, HOPE. So this is the first uh, nomothermic machine perfusion transplant and this is the first HOPE uh, uh, liver transplant uh, uh, in March this year. So this is an issue that came from Amelia and, and we're discussing whether machine perfusion in countries with low disease donation, and I would include Turkey, because Turkey has a massive living donor program, uh, are they putting the cart before the horse or in Italy they put the cart in front of a bull or in Spain they go to empezar la casa por el tejado so they start building a house from the roof so isn't money better spent possibly on a network of coordinators to improve the disease donation network or is it right for uh, these uh, um, uh, centers to have a head start with uh, complex uh, and expensive technology in uh, the first uh, few uh, diseased uh, donor liver transplants. Now the benefits, uh, and some of these are potential benefits of machine perfusion, we know them, reduction of EAD and PNF, uh, increased cellular energy in the liver, viability assessment more for the normothermic but uh, also coming for the hypothermic, reduce uh, ischemic refusion injury, which is more for the hypothermic and less for the normothermic. Reduced biliary complications, known for, no, more for normothermic regional perfusion and for the cold uh, machine. Prolonged preservation, no, more for the uh, warm uh, machine. And therapeutics, uh, which uh, yes, they can be tested in, uh, in uh, current machines, but they'll have more value with machines that have a, a prolonged survival of, uh, uh, shows prolonged survival of livers on machines like this project from Zurich that can uh, keep a liver, uh, a porcine liver at least uh, um, alive for a week. But the issues apart from minor issues of technical complexity, logistical challenge, it's really the cost. And the cost is not just the consumables, it's also the personnel looking after the machine, is the blood. Do you know how much a unit of red blood cells costs in the States? It's $1,500, which means for a perfusion, 
uh, perfused organ, you're going to spend up to five thousand dollars, if not more. The the spaces you need for to do this perfusion. And sorry if I'm protecting my source in Chile, but again the cost comes back. In uh, in uh, I'm asking, are you doing perfusion in Chile? Nothing, not even kidneys. Why? And the issue is money. So and and I've I had uh, answers like this from all over uh, the globe, uh, asking to several uh, friends and colleagues. And if you look, for example, at Organox in the website, you don't know what the, the cost of uh, uh, consumable you will have. <clears throat> so it's difficult really to, to quantify ahead. And the reason for that is also that there are several ways to sell a product. And one of these is you give a machine for free and you pay more the consumables or you pay the machine up front and you pay the consumable less and and um, so so uh, the, that, this is the different uh, difference and the dif difficulty also in in uh, uh, estimating the cost but it goes from anything between two three thousand k to fifty thousand k for uh, some machines uh, uh, worldwide and going back to the survey uh, what was uh, considered an acceptable price for a device and the majority says less than 50,000 euros and what was the acceptable price for one disposable and uh, the majority uh, say less than 2,500 euros now don't look at the green bar uh, I think these are all from Scotland because it's very difficult to find uh, some consumables to less than a thousand euros but uh, but the machine that comes closer to these requests by the transplant uh, community is really some of the uh, new hypothermic uh, uh, devices uh, that come closer to that desired uh, price. Now for the future, we need to find ways to reduce the cost of machine perfusion. And I know that uh, companies put research up front, they have a lot of expenses up front, but there are other ways like simplifying machines. We, we don't need, um, expensive uh, tools and we don't need the, the all the accessories and I'm talking about the car uh, only you can have a yellow car be completely happy and it'll take you from A to B without uh, uh, all the accessories and in terms of studies and I don't want to get into the next topic but we should focus into post transplant complications graft and patient survival we should have a multi-center approach to give good numbers for these studies and not target the DVD uh, nice grafts that do well with static cold storage provided you have a short cold ischemia time, but look at the risk population with DCD and ECDs. And, and finally, we really need to have trials that uh, have uh, adequate uh, endpoints that will help us decide if, when, and where we use machine perfusion in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was an excellent talk. I really think you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, we do have a first question from Dr. Jerwin DeJong from Rasmus Medical Center. Paolo, how do you think we should select cases that need cold or warm machine perfusion up front, especially to restrain, restrain the increasing costs? Sorry, I didn't get that. I had an internet, uh, uh, how do you think we should select the cases that's... that need machine perfusion up front, in, in, especially with costs in mind? Well, it depends uh, what we want them for. Uh, you know, when uh, I really talked with a lot of people, and uh, uh, for example, there was uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people were in favor of doing uh, semi-elective transplants and uh, sleep at night. And in that case, you know, normothermic machine perfusion with good quality levers is an excellent tool to take uh, the preservation time all the way to the morning, where you can do transplants uh, without. Uh, really tiring the transplant surgeons and the whole team too much. Uh, if you want uh, instead to uh, try to see whether, uh, you know, ECD livers or, or DCD livers, uh, particularly looking at the DCD, uh, UK DCD score or other scores to classify, uh, you know, the severity of the, um, let's say, damage injury to, to those livers, uh, then you can, uh, you know, think of uh, using uh, uh, some sort of device. I would, I'm in favor of uh, normothermic regional perfusion, as we've seen, it kind of almost changes 
a DB, a DCD into a DBD, although we shouldn't say it that way, but it's it's like a way to simplify, or hypothermic machine or hope and a sort of hypothermic machine perfusion that doesn't uh, uh, start the inflammatory cascade on the machine like uh, the uh, normal thermic uh, sometimes can. So yeah, that's that's the way I would see it. Okay, thank you very much. So we don't have any questions uh, for Dr. Muyasen right now. Again, you can submit some more and we'll go back with him at the end of the, uh, the presentations. We have our final talk now um, from Dr. Paula Martins on the future trials that are needed in liver machine perfusion. Dr. Martins is a transplant and availability surgeon uh, and associate professor of surgery at the University of Massachusetts. He's been working in the field of liver transplantation in particular machine perfusion for many years and his work has been well recognized both nationally and internationally. So it's a pleasure to have Dr. Martins with us here today. Good morning. I would like to thank the ILTS SIG leadership, especially on Mary and Merit and Bridge to Life for this invitation. I feel very honored and humbled to be in this selected group among pioneers of liver machine perfusion to present this webinar. I have no financial disclosures, and I am not associated with any machine perfusion company. Before talking about where we are going or where we want to be regarding to clinical trials in machine perfusion, we need to ask where we are right now. I will talk about the results and limitations of previous machine perfusion trials, then talk about primary endpoints, the recommendations from the ILTS consensus meeting, and finally, what should be the next trials in the future. There are less than 30 trials in machine perfusion, and most of them were single center, non-randomized, non-controlled, and underpowered. Most of them used as primary endpoint, big transaminase, or EAD, as per Althoff criteria. Most studies that use clinical data as primary endpoint were underpowered. Here are some studies with normal thermic perfusion. I will not go into details. Here are more trials on normal thermic perfusion, more trials. And here are some studies with hypothermic perfusions. Despite over 10 years of existence of liver machine uh, perfusion in the clinic arena, the level of avid evidence is still low. Randomized controlled trials are considered the holy grail to define superiority of a treatment. There are only two published randomized controlled trials in liver machine perfusion, and they have major limitations. One of them was powered for peak of AST as primary outcome and did not show significant improvement in clinical outcomes. And the other one was underpowered with only 10 patients in the perfusion arm. Compared to clinical trials of immunosuppression and other drugs, the field of machine perfusion is underperforming. Here, that's where we probably are. We are at best at the high twos or low ones in the scale of levels of evidence. We all keep saying that machine preservation is better, but so far, do we have enough hard evidence to support that? Recently, there was a huge and heated international debate over the use of hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19 treatment. There were several papers showing better outcomes, but when the randomized controlled trials came out, this was dismissed and it was no longer recommended. Why, despite over 10 years of clinical use of liver machine perfusion, we have a low level of evidence and only two published randomized control, controlled trials. This is because um, besides all limitations of any clinical trial, liver machine perfusion studies have several particular limitations. Differently, compared organs like kidneys and lungs, clinical trials with livers are more difficult to prove superiority with machine perfusion because we don't have a perfect control arm and it requires, therefore, a larger number of patients. Our liver graft acceptance and matching are full of bias, selection bias. The time of randomization has a huge influence on clinical outcomes and may increase selection bias. Well-powered randomized controlled trials require a large number of patients because endpoints like PNF, DAF, graft loss, ischemic cholangiopathy are not frequent events. Important clinical endpoints like patient and graft survival and biliary structures require a long follow-up. 
there is also no reliable biomarker of liver graft viability to be used as a surrogate. Perfusion itself interferes with endpoints, for example, transaminase peak and EAD, the so-called washout phenomena or dilutional effect. In addition, they have difficult blinding of treatment groups because the procurement team is involved with the connection of the graft to the device, the transplant itself, and post-transplant care. Lack of consensus on nomenclature, for example, definition of warm ischemia time in DCD, marginal graft definition, are lacking. There is also no standardization of perfusion parameters like flows, pressure, temperature, time, time type of perfusate, which make comparisons of studies impossible. Perfusion is a time-consuming procedure that requires expertise to connect the graph to the device. Perfusion is expensive and has complex logistics. Um, also, lack of solid funding from industry, differently from big pharma drug trials, machine perfusion device companies are small startups. I will talk now about the limitations of using transaminase and EAD as out of criteria, the oldest and most used um, parameters so far in machine perfusion trials. Transaminase peak does not directly correlate with histological findings, cellular damage. 50% reduction in transaminase does not mean 50% reduction in ischemia reperfusion injury. This has been shown in hepatitis, post-transplant, and after liver resection. Transaminase peak poorly associates with outcomes, both in donor and recipients. It does not get into the calculation of donor risk index, both the American DRI and the European DRI. Serum transaminase levels do not reflect the actual release from the graft in that moment due to their long half-lives. The in vivo natural half-life of AST is 17 hours, and the half-life of ALT is even longer, 47 hours. The peak of transaminase happens 24, 48 hours of, after liver transplant, and will affect the EAD rate as well, criteria of EAD per alt -off. As we know, most of the cases of EAD after liver transplant are related to high peak transaminase, AST or ALT, above 2,000 within the first seven days, and not because of the high INR or bilirubin. Transaminase are re released from the graft during machine perfusion and are discarded together with the pertussate before transplant, artificially lowering the post-transplant levels, the washout phenomenon. There are a few studies assessing the effect of transaminase on the outcomes post liver transplant, but it's believed that it affects outcomes only at extreme high levels. This is a study from the SR, SRTR with over 78,000 transplants showed that peak donor transaminase did not affect graft survival outcomes. Other large studies showed the same and transaminase is not even part of the DRI calculation. This figure illustrates the dilutional or washout effect in livers that are machine perfused. Transaminases are released from the cells into the interstitium and during anaerobic metabolism it accumulates further. Just imagine a liver as a sponge full of, trans full of transaminases. The grafts that are machine perfused are flushed with two, three extra liters of preservation fluid or blood using the circuit and will flush out transaminases accumulating the liver to the perfusate which eventually will be disposed before transplant. Normotemic machine perfusion will release even more transaminase because it rewarms and oxygenates the graft inducing an ex vivo first reperfusion with major release of transaminase before the reperfusion in the patient. All clinical trial, trials so far did not control for that. N none flushed the livers from the cold static preservation arm with the same extra amount of fluid before implantation. This may be something that needs to be done in the future trials to eliminate this confounding factor. I will show you now several papers with transaminase range of the two groups, perfused and non-perfused. All these studies, with the exception of one, did not perf perform histological comparisons using ischemia reperfusion injury scores. 
all show similar post-transplant transaminase curves. This graph shows continued release of transaminase, AST and ALT, the perfusate, during hypothermic machine perfusion. With neurotomic perfusion, the release of transaminase in the perfusate is even higher. This graph shows transaminase post-op in both groups, machine, perfusion, and cold static storage. The initial difference in transaminase disappears after the first two, three days post-transplant and may be explained by the long half-life of transaminase. The early peak for recipients that receive organs stored in cold static preservation may be higher because the graft was more loaded with transaminase since they were not flushed before transplant with the same amount of fluid of the machine perfused grafts. It proceeds higher for a few days, maybe because of the long half-life of transaminase. Eventually, this curve evens out and they become parallel. The difference in transaminase peak that we have seen in all machine perfusion trials were significant. But in both groups, the average peak transaminase was not extremely high, and this makes us question its clinical relevance we can see excellent transplant outcomes even within the range found in these studies without cold preservation. Uh, the same happened in this study here. In both groups, the average peak transaminase were not extremely high, 1,200 versus 1,600. It is highly statistic significant, but it may not have any clinical relevance we usually see good transplant outcomes within this range. This was a multicenter randomized trial with AST peak as primary endpoint, and randomization was done before final acceptance of the organ, which is a limitation in this study. The difference in peak AST of 520 versus 880, although it's statistically extremely significant, they did not have clinical significance all clinical outcomes in this study, with the exception of a lower reperfusion syndrome rate, were the same as the standard preservation group. This study did not show um, histological assessment. And as I mentioned before, there is no direct association of elevated transaminase and histology injury scores. Same happened in this study, 400 versus 900. Same here, 600 versus 900. Here again, like in the other studies, the initial difference in transaminase disappears after the first two, three days. Very similar here as well. The initial difference in transaminase disappears after the first two, three days. This study was randomized, but the sample size was very small. Here, the difference between the groups uh, was not significant. Same here. Difference was 300 versus 1,000. To summarize, transaminases are continuously released in the perfusate during machine preservation perfusion. There is a dilutional effect due to extra fluid used in the machine circuit. It delivers the are machine perfused. Post-transplant transaminase levels are underestimated in machine perfused organs. This reflects an underestimated underestimated EAD rates in the group that receive perfused organs. New EAD definitions are more appropriate for machine per perfusion trials, like um, MIEV, L-Graft, and EASY. This last one was just recently uh, published in JAMA Surgery by an Italian group. Transaminase should not be used as primary endpoints in machine perfusion clinical trials. If used as endpoint, it's preferably to exclude the first three-day level. Uh, other option is to use um, delta transaminase. The peak of transaminase minus the first uh, measurement or the transaminase ratio peak divided by the first one. We can minimize, but will not eliminate the problem. Flushing the graphs of the code static preservation group with the same overall amount of perfusate before transplant may reduce difference due to dilutional effect. 
Now I'm going to talk about organ utilization as endpoint in machine perfusion clinical trials. Organ utilization as endpoint is important, but it's very vulnerable to selection bias because liver graft acceptance is very subjective. There is to date no definitive way to test viability before transplant. Transplant is the ultimate test. I don't think we are there yet to use organ utilization as primary endpoint. Many organs that are declined are perfectly transplantable and are declined because of heavy workload in short staff centers. Time of the day, there is a weekend and holiday effect. And transplant centers respond to flagging by regulatory agencies, especially in the United States. On the other hand, other centers may be willing to take more risk because they are high volume and more experienced centers. There is uh, productivity bonus and other incentives. In addition, when we are part of a trial that is not randomized, that we are biased to use more organs for the trial arm, we believe it's advantageous or for academic promotion or advertisement of the program. Conflict of interest with machine perfusion companies may also bias our decisions. Organ utilization can only become a true valuable endpoint when utilized in very large scale or when definitions of graph viability become well established, which is unlikely to happen in the near future. If the time of randomization happens before final acceptance of the organ at donor OR after visualization and biopsy of the graft, the study is prone to selection bias. For example, the transplant center may accept to use a marginal organ if randomized to the machine perfusion arm, but decline similar graft if randomized to the Stanley preservation group. There is no way to control that. To randomize and commit to use an organ before intra-op visualization and liver biopsy is not an option because this is not ethically acceptable either. If the time of randomization happens after the final decision to use an organ, organ utilization, on the other hand, cannot be assessed. But in this case, the study would be more reliable to assess all other clinical outcomes. The most important question that we have to answer in the future is if machine perfusion really improves the viability of grafts or it's just an amulet to boost our confidence to use a marginal or graft. This is called in psychology the Dumble Magic Feather Effect, an analogy to the Disney movie of a flying elephant that believed he could only fly when holding a magic feather, when indeed he could fly all along. First, we need to prove that machine preser perfusion preservation really improves craft preservation unequivocally. Studies need to show that it improves histological change, graft function, and that improves patient and graft survival. We haven't shown that yet. We need well-designed and well-powered randomized controlled trials. To back up what I just said, I would like to show studies that show that liver graft acceptance is extremely biased. There are studies showing that during weekends and nighttime, we accept, accept less liver grafts. In addition, there are several reports from all over the world showing great outcomes with marginal organs that have been turned down by all other local and regional centers and were successfully transplanted with just standard code study preservation. The results were similar to grafts allocated with standard preservation code study. Here are two more of those studies. All of these studies showed comparable outcomes of discarded grafts with grafts normally allocated, just to name a few studies. I think there are more than 12 studies when I review that. I think before starting machine perfusion trial, it's also very important to describe and publish the protocol in a public platform or as a protocol paper 
in a peer-reviewed journal. This enhanced transparency of research, reduce publication bias, and prevent selective reporting of research outcome to prevent um, that the results are almost like fishing expedition and looked after after the study has been done. And in addition, trials should follow standard recommendations of quality standards. Last year, we con convened in Venice for the ILTS consensus conference on DCD and liver machine perfusion to establish recommendations for machine perfusion clinical trials. Here is the link to the video presentation of our working group. This was the working group that I had the honor to chair together with Mike Rizari. There were 36 invited faculty in this meeting and 150 attendees. This meeting ended up with a consensus paper that was accepted for publication transplantation in press now. We agreed with the following recommendations. Nomenclature standardization to allow future comparisons between studies and meta-analysis. Pre-trial registration of study protocol in public trial register, registries and peer-reviewed journals. Preference for randomized trials and preference to include marginal graphs instead of standard graphs. The, the right randomization time should depend on the primary endpoint investigated. At the time of patient listing or at the time of the organ offer, if the goal is to assess, compare organ utilization, or after final organ acceptance, after visualization biopsy at the donor hospital, if the goal is to assess post-transplant outcomes and cost effectiveness. Support for multi-center consortium trial, trials. It does not make sense to have many underpowered single center studies and not be able to draw any conclusion from that. Creation of an international registry of all cases of liver machine perfusion. Preference to use clinical data as primary endpoints instead of surrogate lab endpoints. Preference for trials that compare machine perfusion techniques with standard preservation techniques, static code preservation, before comparing the different, different machine perfusion techniques like hypothermic, normal thermic, or normal thermic regional perfusion. Redefinition of earlier allograft dysfunction, validation of compos composite endpoints of EAD in machine perfusion trials. Intention to treat analysis, detailed description of every graft that was damaged or lost during machine per perfusion. Collection of biospecimen, perfusate bio liver and bio duct, post -per perfusion protocol biopsy and assessment of skin reperfusion injury by standard damage scores. Contingency plan for backup allocation system in case the primary team declines the graft after perfusion. To conclude, I would like to say that clinical trials in machine preservation so far have in general poorer quality. There are several specific limitations. Our community needs to improve reporting of machine perfusion clinical trials the bars for reporting clinical trials in machine preservation should be raised. To answer the question of this talk about what clinical trials are needed for liver machine perfusion in the future, I think the most important is to have large, well-powered, multi-center randomized controlled clinical trials with relevant clinical data as primary endpoints to establish the superiority of machine perfusion. In addition, it would be of critical importance to assess viability criteria in a randomized way so that we can determine reliably when a marginal graft cannot be transplanted and if those livers can be resuscitated after this and successively transplanted. Cost effectiveness studies are also very important because it's the only way to justify the extra cost of 10 to 50,000 US dollars for the sterile disposable and other costs associated with each perfusion. After that, in the future, we can do other studies 
to, for example, compare different modalities of machine perfusion, assess treatment efficacy during machine preservation, and to test other exotic, exotic use of machine perfusion, like split liver, excito, liver tumor removal, and so on. To finish my presentation, I would like to say that during adoption of any new technology, there is always a hype cycle. With machine preservation, it's not different. I think we are here right now. I hope that we reach the plateau of productivity in the near future and liver machine preservation becomes the new golden standard of uh, liver preservation. Thanks so much for your attention and I'm glad to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Martins. That was an excellent talk. Uh, we do have a couple of questions now uh, from the audience, from Dr. Dejong again. Paolo, are you aware of any reliable functional parameters for machine perfusion to assess liver function, excluding lactate? What kind of markers may these be, such as microRNAs or proteins produced by the liver? Oh, great question. So there is uh, no high level of evidence of reliable availability markers. Uh, these trials are going on right now, but there are many um, candidates for viability. And we have to differentiate viability of the liver parenchyma, like hepatocyte, hepat hepatocyte function and cholangiocyte function that reflects uh, biliary damage and future uh, biliary ischemia uh, cholangiopathy. So uh, for uh, hepatocyte function, we have uh, clotting factors or uh, factor five that have been investigated, but any uh, coagulation marker uh, could be used as a uh, surrogate of liver function. Uh, in terms of um, biliary injury markers, we have uh, biliary composition. Biliary composition is even more important than the bioflow itself or the biovolume production. And a lot of things have been investigated. It's uh, the amount of uh, sodium, uh, bicarb, pH, uh, glucose level, and um, uh, bioacids. All these uh, reflect um, the level of the cholangiocyte function. And that's of critical importance for DCT grafts because we know that the Achilles heels of these grafts are the biliary complications. And regarding uh, what you mentioned about microRNAs, that has been uh, studied. There are some candidates, special microRNAs that might be uh, very specific for cholangiocytes. Um, but it, it, all of those are not very reliable because they are still under investigation. And um, in the lab, is it easier to, to check for them? In the clinic, the only way to reliably I'm talking about reliably test the viability markers would be with randomized trials. And so far there is none. Okay, thank you very much. Another question from Dr. Eliana Bonacorsi, uh, and this is for both of the speakers. Uh, what would your, in your opinion, the niche for machine perfusion be in liver transplantation in the future? Yeah, um, I, I, it's a great question. And I think because of the um, complexity, the logistics and costs, I think it should be reserved for marginal grafts, especially DCD grafts. I don't see why a 20 year old uh, liver without fat needs to be uh, machine perfused. If it was cheap, easy, I would say yes for all of them. But because of these limitations that I just mentioned, I, should, uh, I think it should be restricted to high risk grafts. Uh, I agree entirely with Paolo. I think I would uh, refuse all the CDs and uh, ECDs, but uh, otherwise standard grafts uh, at this stage, probably there's no enough evidence to do. Okay, uh, in the lack of any questions, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions, uh, I guess to the both of you. Uh, 
in countries or in places or groups that are starting to use perfusion technologies, do you have any recommend recommendation as to which technologies to start with that might be more easier or more cost uh, efficient or effective? I think Paulo can go first. Okay, uh, you mean in countries that without that much experience? I think uh, uh, probably hypothermic is uh, has a lower cost uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, less complex. Let's put it like that. Maybe that's the easy one to start with, uh, and uh, and and then uh, we can go to uh, the you know a more complex level to. Uh, normal thermic, but still within the areas that we uh, defined. Really. I agree with that. Okay, I think there's some people trying to ask questions. We have one uh, from Arun Verma. Have you or any other group investigated the costs and utility of blood substitutes for machine perfusion to reduce costs? This is for Dr. Muyasan. The, not uh, my group, but uh, certainly in Birmingham, they've uh, looked at this and they looked at uh, some blood substitutes uh, in other groups around the world, but I don't know the cost effectiveness of that. Looking at the price that I didn't know before of uh, a unit of blood, it is probably likely to be cost effective. Yeah, I know that there's some groups that have studied some hemoglobin carriers as a blood substitute, uh, but not done in the clinic. That was experimentally. And I think there is also a group trying to use uh, per perfluorocarbons, uh, PFCs, that also is an oxygen carrier um, as a, a blood substitute, but they don't mix. It's not water soluble. That's an issue. Uh, another question from Dr. Atia. How do we convince the FDA or really the regulatory agencies that the early allograft dysfunction definition, and by that I would understand the old half definition, is not a valid uh, endpoint for NMT, NMP trials as it doesn't correlate with long-term graft function? You know, I can um, start this, um, uh, this answering this question. And I think that's, uh, it's very difficult because even our community, even ourselves are just now realizing that EAD as per Althoff or, or transaminase themselves are not good markers for, or reliable markers of uh, long-term outcomes. Um, I think that they, they are not aware. It's, it's still our community, our uh, groups, and I'm not saying that as a, a bad criticism. I, I value and I respect every uh, uh, researcher and investigator, uh, the pioneers. At that time, that information and the data was not out and with any uh, clinical uh, new uh, therapies, that there is uh, evolution. And I think we are now uh, at this level that we need to move to, to a higher standard. I'm not saying that these trials um, are not valid or they are not good, but it's a natural evolution of any anything in medicine. And the F FDA will eventually see that we need uh, more hard evidence to, to bring this forward because that has a major implication in, in terms of costs and uh, overall healthcare costs. Okay, we have actually uh, several questions now. So the uh, it seems to be piquing everyone's interest from Alejandro Rosano. What is the most sensitive parameter of good perfusion during machine liver perfusion? And then another question I'll add on that you can uh, think about as well is, is it not possible to use the donor blood in, to fill the circuit? I wouldn't use the donor blood uh, because there is uh, probably a cytokine storm in there. So you don't really want to use that kind of blood uh, with the... Um, in the as a perfusate really i agree with, with paulo in, ter in terms of the other question paulo what do you think uh regarding this question i agree completely you. with you um about the blood because uh, there is a lot of it's an inflammatory milieu and we don't want it to expose 
a graft to the same environment. I completely agree. And about the, the other question, uh, the good parameter of perfusion, I think um, the visualization, consistency of the liver, and also uh, I think uh, the group of uh, Chris Watson showed that there are some vasoplegia response. It's, uh, it's the need for response to vasodilators. And that's something that it's quite interesting. And I think that will be in the future used for viability criteria as well. Okay, and perfect. Biliary pH and biliary bicarb as well. They may be prom promising markers. From James Richards, in the absence of decent randomized controlled trial data, is it unethical to decline to transplant patients based on poor perfusion parameters? given that we do not know what it means, whereas we know that li liver transplantation is a life-saving option for the patients? I can answer that. Um, I would not machine perfuse currently any liver that I would not otherwise transplant. I think first we need to prove that it's superior to push the envelope, to go uh, to be more aggressive and to use livers that we would otherwise not transplant, like a, a, a liver with 80% macrosteatosis or uh, 70 years old DCD. I would not do that just based on my impression that machine perfusion is superior without hard evidence. Paolo, do you have anything to add? No. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, can we ethically justify this is from Dr. Ernest Hidalgo. Can we ethically justify a static cold storage arm in an RCT? Paolo? I didn't hear. Can we ethically justify a static cold storage arm in an RCT? The question of the ethics, essentially, a randomized controlled trial with static cold storage. Um, well, I don't... Oh, go ahead, Paolo. It's been a standard of care for so many years. I think uh, it is ethical. Yeah, I agree. And I think at this point, it's more important to compare specific techniques of machine perfusion with cold standard preservation or cold static preservation. Only after we know that it's advantageous, then we can compare um, different techniques among themselves. Because all these trials require a large number of uh, patients involved. If we try several arms, it will reduce the overall N of uh, each group, and then the statistical comparison will be compromised. I think more important is compare each individual techniques like a normal, uh, uh, normal thermic regional perfusion, hypothermic perfusion, and normal thermic machine perfusion with cold standard preservation itself. And only after we show that there is a superiority, then we can compare, because what is the point? I think there is room for every type of machine preservation. I'm not claiming that one is superior to the other. And in the future, probably, there will be a mix of them or for different use, different applications. And I don't think it's the point now to prove that one is superior to the other. OK. Um... So I think we're going to finish up. I have a couple of questions left on the screen. I'm going to ask no one else to submit any because we're going over time a little bit. Um, so we have a question from William Bennett. The definition of extended criteria varies worldwide. Perhaps there might be, uh, do you think, a time for an international consensus on the definition of extended criteria donors or extended criteria graphs? Uh, I agree. That would be... Great, but there are some new kids in the block. There is one uh, recently from Italy, the Easy Score, that um, uh, Paolo mentioned, that may be a promising one. Um, so, so as Paolo said, we need to move away from uh, markers of injury alone, because uh, you know, at, at least for DCDs, uh, seventy percent of our livers. Uh, fit the EAD criteria, and yet they do absolutely fine. So a little bit more transaminases uh, immediately, peak transaminases after transplant, doesn't really mean much. Um, 
so so yeah that's uh, my view i think it would be a good idea to have international consensus about what it means extended criteria not to uh to make a, a important point what it really means but to compare studies in the future i think that especially when people are in the future trying to do meta-analysis of study would be helpful to have uh, uh, like agreed definition of what marginal means. All right, well, thank you everyone so much. I, I know we have a couple of more questions, but we're actually 20 minutes over schedule and some of our speakers have to attend to other uh, duties. So I'd like to thank everyone again so much for attending today. This concludes our two ILTS Bridge to Life sponsored webinars. Again, we'd like to thank Bridge to Life so much for providing this great educational opportunity. And we look forward to seeing you at other ILTS webinars in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you to you all. Thanks, Thanks, so much. Thanks for meeting. Thank you for your attention.